Today we're in this series called Eternity, and we're going to be studying a passage of Scripture out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And so if you have your Bible with you, I want you to turn there and start reading at verse 1. Today we're going to talk about some, some heavy stuff, but uh, let's, let's get after it and let's see what the Lord has to say to us. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them, even if they claim to have had a special vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. So remember, This is a letter that's being written to a group of Christians, the early church Christians, and they're waiting for Jesus' second coming. Jesus said, I'm coming back, and now they're expecting it. And apparently in their community, there were people who said, Christ has come back and you've missed it. Christ has come back and he's left you behind. And the Apostle Paul and Silas and Timothy who are writing this letter, these early church Christian leaders are writing this letter and saying, no, you haven't missed it. Jesus hasn't come back yet. Don't listen to these people who say they have this vision or this revelation. It hasn't happened yet. But here's what you should look for. Verse 3. Don't be fooled by what they say, for that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming that he himself is God. Now let's stop here for a second. Here in these four verses, we are given some insight for what to look for as the time approaches for Jesus' second coming to take place. And these are what I'm calling second coming indicators. Second coming indicators. And the first indicator, point number one in your app notes, will involve an increased rebellion against the things of God. One of the things that's going to take place as Christ's return begins to kind of ramp up is that there will be an increased rebellion against the things of God. Friends, as Jesus is preparing to return to usher in a new heaven and a new earth. And we haven't even talked about that yet. God's going to create a new earth that we as Christians are going to rule. We'll talk about that in detail. And then he's going to create this new heaven as well. But before all of that happens, what these Bible writers are telling us is that there is going to be an an increased polarization between good and evil. We're told here that there will be this secret power, evil power that will be at work in our world. You know, when we survey our world today, I propose, and maybe you would agree with me on this, that there is a growing amount of evil taking place in our communities you know, just this past week, if you, if you didn't hear, our California governor, Gavin Newsom, signed a gender identity bill which provides another layer of sort of insulation between what the school does and what a parent does. Basically, this bill now limits a parent's ability to parent their children. The people who support this bill will say, well, no, we're just simply supporting kids. We're providing kind of this, this realm of, of the safety ring to, if they want to come out of the closet, so, so to speak. It, it, it will give them their, you know, the safety piece. But in my opinion, it's evil. In fact, I would propose that any time the government or the state or whatever legislator you want to lean at, any time the government tries to limit a parent's ability to parent their child, in my opinion, that is evil. And if you don't agree with me on that, I would love for you to, well, let's debate it. Let's go. Let's, let's have a conversation. It'd be, I'd be up to uh, the challenge. But a second indicator that we're told we are, will take place as the time approaches for Jesus' second return, is that this leader will emerge who will demand to be worshipped. Indicator number two, a leader 
who demands to be worshipped. That's one of the things that we are told to look for as Jesus' return uh, approaches. Look at verse, look again at verse 4. It says, he will exalt himself and defy everything that people call, call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. Now skip down to verse 9. He says, this man will do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. So what are we being told here? Friends, the Bible writers are informing us that as the time for Jesus' return, as it begins to approach, that evil in this world is going to increase. A leader is going to emerge on the world stage, eventually asking people to worship him. And how are we going to be able to identify who this leader is? Three suggestions. Letter A in your notes. This leader will proclaim to be God. This leader will be proclaimed to be God. Letter B, this leader will showcase miraculous activity. This, so what, this leader is going to be a spiritual leader. This leader is going to basically be coming, probably going to be claimed to be a Christian or could be, I guess, Muslim. But this, Christ, this person will be a spiritual leader that, God, that the devil, basically God is allowing the devil to give supernatural power to do miraculous activity. And then letter C, he will target non-Christians asking for their allegiance. He will target non-Christians asking for their allegiance. Look again at verse 9. This man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. Verse 10. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies. Then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. Listen, the characteristic work of the lawless one is to oppose the things of God and understand that he is not Satan, but he is Satan's instrument. He will be imbued, if you will, if that, is that a right word? Imbued with Satan's power and authority and, and sort of his spirit. Now, I want you to turn to the book of Daniel, if you will. That's in the Old Testament portion of our Bible. It might be a hard book to find. You've got Isaiah, then Jeremiah, then Lamentation, or Ezekiel, Lamentations, and then the book of Daniel. And go to chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Now, the book of Daniel, as you're finding your place, as many of you know, is basically a book that is an autobiography of a young Jewish slave who had been abducted from his homeland when the armies of King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, defeated the nation of Israel in war, in battle. In biblical days, as many of you know, if a king would defeat another nation in war, it was common protocol to sort of pilfer a nation's assets. They would take their money, they would take their crops, and most importantly, a nation, a winning nation, would pilfer and they would take its people, particularly their children. And they would indoctrinate their children with sort of the, their own, in King Nebuchadnezzar's example, with the Babylonian way of thinking. Many times the children would be either put into roles where they would be considered slaves or often the young boys would be recruited to be a part of the, the Babylonian army. And so what we read here, the Bible describes the book of Daniel as Daniel was a, a young man. He was, comes from royalty who had been acquired sort of, if you will, in this war pilfering. And then one of the things that made King Nebuchadnezzar such an amazing leader, one of the habits that he practiced that made him so great is that any time he would defeat another nation in war, he would test the intellectual ability of the people who he captured. And so Daniel, we're told, along with his, with his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you know their story, were four young men from the nation of Judah who King Nebuchadnezzar tested, and he found them to have incredible 
intellectual amazing proclivities. And Daniel especially set himself apart with this ability, this God-given ability to interpret dreams. You ever had a dream when you're sleeping at night? Some of us sometimes forget. Some of us remember what it's like the next morning. But Daniel had this ability. If you had a dream, and King Nebuchadnezzar had a couple of dreams where Daniel was able to hear the dream, he would then interpret the dream. And one of the ways you can tell if a prophet is a true prophet or not is if what he says comes true. And in many cases, when Daniel would interpret King Nebuchadnezzar's dreams, he would basically foretell the future events. And so Daniel had this amazing supernatural gift. Well, here in the book of Daniel, I I want you, it's important for us to understand this because here in the book of Daniel, chapters 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, Daniel describes some things for us that are going to take place during Jesus' second coming. In full disclosure, these things, what Daniel writes are, are, are pretty hard to understand. Guys, or, you know, scholars have debated what this means, but here's what I want us to capture today. One of the things that Daniel prophesied is that as the time of Jesus' return approaches, there will be a change in government leadership. Specifically, four governments are going to rise up to rule the world, which is one of the reasons why it's so important for us to pay attention to global politics. And in today's conversation, I want you to notice what Daniel writes here in chapter 7, verse 15. Daniel chapter 7 Verse 15, this is what he says. I, Daniel, I, Daniel, was troubled by all I had seen, and my visions terrified me. So Daniel had a dream. He had this vision. And he says that this vision scares him. Verse 16. So I approached one of those standing beside the throne and asked him what it meant. And so David, Daniel's having this dream. He's having this vision of basically heaven. And next to the, the throne of God is this angel who he sees. And in his dream, he's having this conversation. And he, he asks this angel basically for clarity as to what this vision means. It's, it's a, a surreal moment. So he says, I approached one of those standing out beside the throne and asked him what it meant. And he explained it to me like this. Verse 17, these four huge beasts represent four kingdoms that will arise from the earth. So Daniel has a dream that involves four beasts. And he's told these four beasts represent four kingdoms, four governments, which I alluded to already. He says they will arise from the earth, but in the end, catch this, the holy people of the Most High, friends, that's you and me, The holy people of the Most High will be given the kingdom and they will rule forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, the one so different from the others and so terrifying, it had devoured and crushed its victims with iron teeth and bronze claws, trampling their remains beneath its feet. So what's he saying? He's saying that of these four governments, there's going to be the fourth government, the fourth beast, the fourth government leader who is going to basically trample Christians. If you're a Christian and you're still around at the time of, that this takes place, you will be persecuted. But if we go back to that earlier verse, you can know that eventually you will persevere. But for a season, it's going to be super, super hard. Now skip down to verse 23. Then he said to me, this angel, this fourth beast is the fourth world power that will rule the world earth. It will be different from all the others. It will, be, it will devour the whole world, trampling and crushing everything in its path. Its ten horns are ten kings who will rule their empire. And so in other words, there's going to be a king prior to Jesus' coming back. There's going to be these four governments that are going to be fighting for each other, these four world powers. It could be United States. It could be China. It could be Russia. It could be you pick one other nation. They're going to be fighting, and of those four nations, one of them is going to rise to the top, and this leader is going to appoint ten leaders to kind of manage, if you will, the world's estate. It says, he will devour the whole world, trampling it and crushing everything in its path. Verse 24, its ten horns are ten kings who will rule that empire. Then another king will arise, different from the other team, ten, who will subdue three of them. 
He will defy the Most High and oppress the holy people of the Most High. He will try to change their sacred festivals and laws and they will be placed under his control for a time, times, and half a time. You know, when we think about COVID a couple years ago, remember how it, the government was shutting everything down, how they were saying you cannot meet as Christians? You can't meet in holy places? That's a, that's a foretelling, that's a teaser of what's going to come. And, 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 and we have a decision as Christians, are we going to stand up to that or are we going to acquiesce? And so you don't, don't think that COVID was a one-off, brothers and sisters. That was just a teaser. I oftentimes say to Robin, you know, you ever, I don't know if you ever, this is a, a rabbit trail. We'll get a rabbit trail here. You ever do GPS and it tells you to take this, this certain route? I think a lot of times GPS is testing us, is conditioning us. They'll say, I want you to go this way because they just want us to get in the habit of following the GPS when in reality, the, this other way that you would normally going to take w- would be just the same. It's just me. Just how I think, I'm kind of a, uh, you know, controversy person. Uh, what do you, what's the word, the C word? Um, uh, conspiracy theorist. But that's how you have to think when it comes to the end times. The Bible says that we're going to be deceived. And the devil's not going to be, a, he's not going to be straightforward. He's not going to be, he's not honest. The Bible says the devil masquerades in, 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 in shades of light, right? He's going to be deceptive. And that's what we're told here. He's going to try to change our sacred festivals. He's going to change our laws and that they will be placed under his control for a time, times, and half a time. Verse 26. But then the court will pass judgment. Whose court? Jesus' court. Then the core will pass judgment and all his power will be taken away and completely destroyed. Then the sovereignty, power, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be given to its holy people, to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will last forever and all rules will serve and obey him. So in other words, God's going to, God's still in control and we're going to talk about this in a second. So this, I'll close with this. That was the end of the vision and I, Daniel, was terrified by my thoughts and my face was pale with fear but I kept these things to myself. Now, let me give you one more verse, and then we'll make this practical. Go to chapter 11, Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. Just one verse. Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. These are all indicators of what's going to take place prior to the second coming of Jesus. Verse 36. It says, the king will do as he pleases, exalting himself and claiming to be greater than Every God, even blaspheming the God of gods, he will succeed, but only until the time of wrath is completed. He will succeed, but only until the time of wrath is completed. So here's what I want us to know today. Jesus' second coming, friends, is going to unleash a season of evil. And at first, this season of evil will be hard to discern, and it will be extremely subtle. Which was one of the reasons why it's so important for you and I to study the Bible like we're doing today. Because it will guide us. It will protect us. The Bible teaches that the devil will target everyone. Certainly Christians. But especially the Bible tells us that he will target those who reject Jesus, those who enjoy sin. Why? Because they don't have the protection of the Holy Spirit. And so for those of you who have family members, and this is the sobering part, who maybe you're sort of wandering away from God, we need to continue to pray for them because they are going to be at risk. They need your prayers. They need my prayers. Here in Daniel chapter 7 through 12, we are given an example of what is to come. And you do know, don't you, that when you entertain sin, that you make yourself vulnerable to the devil's activity, to the devil's power. You know, I had a, we had a conversation with somebody this, this just this past week about smoking marijuana. I don't know if you ever smoked marijuana. I have when I was in a, a high school kid, you know. And one of the things that I experienced firsthand, and one of the things that cause, has led me to believe this to be true, is that people say smoking marijuana is innocent. It's not innocent, brothers. It's a gateway drug to worse drugs. Because when you smoke or you take any kind of drugs that gives, basically, you lose your ability to think rationally, 
You are opening yourself up to the enemy's activity. Just be aware of that. Which is one of the reasons why it's so important for us to be involved in conversations like this. It's important for us to confess our sins to, e to each other and to God so that he can cleanse us, he can protect us. Why? Because we are at risk of, of the devil's attacks. You know, almost every time I do a long motorcycle trip, it seems like I encounter some kind of me mechanical challenge. That's just one of the risks that you have when you're driving in extreme heat for hours upon hours upon hours over roads that are bumpy that will jar your teeth sometimes. Things break down. And again, I was reminded of it this, this past summer, just how the motorcycle community, they will often drop what they're doing at the moment to help a person who's in need. And in, in many cases, I'll think, man, the motorcycle family acts more like the church sometimes than the church sometimes acts. It's, it, it's really incredible. Friends, one of the purposes of the church is for us to help each other grow. Would you agree with that? We're not to judge. We're not to critique. I mean, we're supposed to, you know, have an opinion, but when we, when we provide direction or insight or accountability, we should do so with love. We should do so with encouragement. We should do so with, hey, come on, you can do better than that. We need to help one another be alert to the devil's activities. And so before Jesus comes back, friends, things are going to get really hanky. Be ready. So let me give you three takeaway truths as I land the plane here that I want to leave with you with today that I hope will encourage you. Okay, so takeaway truth number one, write this down. Even amidst chaos, God is still in control. Even amidst chaos, God is still in control. As the time for Jesus' coming starts to gather steam in the world as things start to move into turmoil and hankiness, friends, don't allow the words turmoil, turmoil to discourage you because even in the midst of chaos, the Bible teaches us that God is in control. In fact, on the count of three, I want you to say out loud in unison this phrase, God is always in control. Are you ready? God is always in control. One, two, three. He is always in control. Even in the midst of chaos, God is always in control. Truth number two. In the end, God wins. In the end, God wins. Nothing can prevail against him. Let that sink in. Nothing can prevail against Jesus. And so when you're facing challenges in your life, whether it's a medical challenge or a financial challenge or a relational challenge or just a dream challenge, recognize that God is on your side and he is with you and in the end he wins. Friends, the devil, we know this, is in the discourage, discouragement business. Would you agree with that? The devil is a master at breaking people's hearts, and he's a master at destroying people's lives. And although it may, at times it may feel like he is winning, the Bible teaches us and reinforces us today this truth that in the end, end God wins. And so in your heart and in your mind today, if you need to hear that, tell yourself that because nothing can prevail against God. Say amen. amen. Truth number three, God uses the consequences of sin to punish the sinner. Now, this is sobering. The Bible teaches us that God uses the consequences of sin to punish the sinner. You know, when we read the book of 2 Thessalonians, the apostle Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they're writing to these early Christians, they're writing to you and me, we don't have to necessarily live in the Thessalonica region, but they're writing to encourage basically say, you need to encourage each other. You need to support one another. These are your battle plans that as the time for Jesus' return approaches, understand that the devil is going to be given freedom and that freedom is going to really, it's going to make things really challenging for us. But hold on to the truth. Encourage one another. Hold on to the truth and hold on to Jesus 
that as sin increases, so too can holiness. Because holiness always trumps sin. So what's the transferable concept? In closing, I propose this. If you choose, if I choose to participate in sinful activities, while Jesus will certainly forgive you and me, understand that if we allow the if we allow sin into our lives, that God is going to allow us to suffer the consequences from it. That being said, when you fall down, look up. Ask Jesus to be at work in your life. Understand that the devil is going to try to trip you up. And when he trips you up, just keep getting back up. Keep lifting your eyes to the Lord. Friends, this week, some of you are going to, chances are strong, that some of you are going to encounter some stuff that is going to throw you off balance. You're going to experience some things that will surprise you. Maybe they'll even discourage you. Don't lose hope. Life's not always easy. Sometimes parts break, like we experienced in Arnold, Nebraska. But God's got his people everywhere. And if you just lift up your eyes and if you're willing to open and say, will you help me? Can you help me? Which is the purpose of the church. As we lean on God and as we lean on each other, God is going to get us back on the road. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know if you're feeling discouraged, but I want to encourage you. God's got you. He's with you. It may not be easy, but he's with you. And he is orchestrating every event to shape you into the person that he wants you to be. So let's say a final prayer. As David joins me up here on stage, let's put our palms out in front of us. Let's take a deep breath in again. Just exhale. Just center down. Now I invite you to pray this in your heart. Say, dear Jesus, please forgive me for my sins. Maybe there's something specific that you would like Jesus to ask to forgive. Just say, Jesus, help me to be better with, and then you fill in the blank. Where are you struggling? Where are you falling down? Where do you tend to to maybe trip up. Just say, Jesus, please help me to do better with, and then you fill in the blank. Where do you want to grow? Now finally say this, Jesus, as I encounter chaos this week, in those moments, please remind me that you are in control. And please use me to be an encourager to others this is my eternity prayer today in your name. And all God's people said, amen. Brothers and sisters, for those of us who are followers of Jesus, we have God on our side, amen. Better than that, we're on God's team. And so you're a winner. You're a winner. And so as you go out this week and as you encounter stuff, and we are all going to encounter stuff, Say, you know what? I'm a winner. Devil, get behind me. Uh, I'm God's ambassador. So stand up against evil. I bless you today in the name of God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to stand up against evil. Follow your heart. And when you fall down and when you sin, confess it, look up, and keep moving forward. Don't live in the pit because you are on God's team. Even amidst the chaos, God wins. I bless you, my brothers and sisters. Have a great week. Amen and amen and amen.